So I'll just say a little bit more about myself and kind of how we arrived at this day. So I'm a theatre academic. Um, I'm based at Royal Holloway University of London, um, the Department of Drama, Theatre and Dance. Um, and I've been researching for about, I don't know, over 20 years, I think, uh, contemporary Black British theatre and performance, um, thinking particularly about representations of race and intersections with gender and sexuality. And I'm particularly interested in performance that that is political or performance that has a, a, an impact on the, the ways in which we understand black identities, black lives, um, and so on. So I kind of have this sense that theatre needs to do something. Um, and at the moment, I'm working on a, a series of articles about race and intersectionality in performance, looking at themes such as black men in the police, um, race, asylum and immigration, uh, race and legacies of enslavement. And I'm just... Um, part way through designing a, a grant project on kind of race, social justice, climate justice and environmental justice. And some of that will involve uh, Modge's work as well. And Modge and I are also working together on editing an anthology of black British um, queer plays and performance practitioners, an anthology of Afri-queer Afri theatre. Um, so in all of that, I'm kind of interested in political work, activist work, the ways in which um, yeah, black performance contributes to debates about black identities. And much of that has kind of shaped the approach to and, and design of today. Um, so this is the third event in the Techni Conflux um, series of events on queer feminist currents. Uh, the first two events, Queer Futurity was the first event, and then a second event on feminismos, anti-patriarchalism and poetic disobedience. They're archived um, in the link, in a link that will be repasted for you today. So if you want to go back and look at those events, then please do. Um, so when I was thinking about what I could contribute to this series, um, there's five events in all. So this is the third, and then there'll be two more, and then there'll be, we'll end with a, a conference, so actually six events in all. So when I was thinking about what I might contribute, I immediately went to this idea of Afri-queer performance. Um, so as I said, I'm interested in black work that does something in the world, that's social, political, and active, that contributes to debates about black lives, identities, and experiences. And when um, Ellie and Sarah Gorman invited me to be part of this conflux, I immediately went to, to Modge's work, of course, because it fits. Uh, very much with those ideas, work on queering black histories, telling black stories, climate change, global warming, addressing complex themes of sexuality, social care, responding to Black Lives Matter in various different ways. So the interrogation of Sandra Bland, um, which we may hear a bit about this morning, um, uh, issues around so-called collective rape of lesbians and trans men in South Africa, reflections on non-consensual surgeries on intersex bodies, uh, combined with reflections on traditional harmful practices um, in STARS. Um, and last week, I just want to take a moment to, for us all to applaud Modge because uh, Modge's newest play, Family Tree, uh, won the Alfred Fagan Award for best new play by, is it Black, British and, African Caribbean, African and African Caribbean writer 2021. So I just want to take a moment to, to mark that. It's a, a massive, massive award. So you can uh, unmute and applaud so that we can hear the applaud. Well done. Well done. Thank you very it's much, a, a wonderful, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's a wonderful, like, wonderful applaud award. Applaud now. You better yes, applaud, yeah. my friend. Applaud now. Yes, applaud my friend now. <laughs> <laughs> Following in the footsteps you. <laughs> of, you know, Michaela Cowell, Roy Williams, Winston Pinnock. This is this this award is massive and uh, many congratulations. And it's a wonderful, wonderful piece, which you'll hear much more about um, this afternoon. Um, so I won't actually even do any spoilers, but it interweaves loads of kind of complex contemporary and past past issues. So um, look forward to this afternoon and you'll, you'll hear much more about that. So I've been interested in Afri-queer as a way of using theatre and performance to debate black lives. So in Modge's work, this is political, provocative, playful, poetic, 
um, inviting audiences to take action, um, instigating social change. Uh, the performances use direct address, audience interaction, physical theater, song, music, moments of call and response, multimedia. Um, and um, a lot of your work, Marge, isn't it? You're kind of quite committed to accessibility, to making the work accessible to uh, DDEF um, observers, watchers, and audience members. Um, so do it using onstage interpreters in some of the work and projecting the spoken words. And what I find interesting about Africa is the way that it puts Black British work into spaces, so into queer spaces that have largely been white, um, or African American, so particularly bring in the Black British voice um, in there. And as you've read in the articles, if you've looked at some of the resources, you'll see that Moj discusses Afroqueer, both in terms of Moj's own work, but also thinking about how it connects with her peers, with Moj's peers in the UK and the USA, how it connects with theatre, film, music, dance, poetry, comedy, and so on. So it, as part of designing the event, it, became really important then to reach out to other Afri-queer Afri and Afro-queer practitioners, activists and academics to bring them into the conversation about this work and approach to the work. So we have Tofa Campbell with us uh, this morning. Tofa, brup, brup, brup. Uh, Theatre director, filmmaker, um, importantly co-founder of, of Ruckus Federation, Foundation. Tofa will correct me on that, uh, with Ajamu X, a, a very, very important um, archiving, um, um, a very, very important initiative to archive Black um, queer lives. Um, fetish, which again, available just until 5 p.m. today. So if you haven't watched it, please make sure you click on the link and, and watch that um, during the lunch break or just as soon as we finish this afternoon. Um, and that chimes well with today's themes in terms of connecting black lives with activism, with um, uh, activist filmmaking, with queer themes and with um, Afrofuturism. So we'll be, I'll be asking Topher to talk a little bit more about that um, in, a, in a moment. And this notion of Afroqueer, brings the African continent into view. And so we felt in designing the day that it was really, really important to have a voice from Africa um, to chime with our Black British um, situated voices. Um, and so this afternoon we'll be joined by Zaitu Matabeni, um, who will, um, whose who's work, um, whose own work is kind of activist, uh, polit political, a scholar, a filmmaker also, and will respond to Moj's work that Moj shares with us on Family Tree and the ways in which that chimes with uh, Zetu's work. So that's a kind of a little bit just about the day, um, um, how that day is organized and some of the kind of thinking behind the day. Um, so we're gonna move now into a, a discussion with uh, Moj, Tofa and myself. Um, so we've known each other, we were trying to work this out. I think we've known each other for about 25 years or so, all of us, since we were um, out clubbing on the um, same black queer social clubbing scene. And we were also at the same time, um, all developing our careers as theatre practitioners, filmmakers, theatre academics, um, and our work over these years has continued to evolve um, in response to kind of shifting debates and um, shifting debates in shifting languages um, and shifting ideas. Uh, Marge and Tofa have both remained committed, I think, to really foregrounding Black queer work. My work shift, shifted a little bit away from um, focusing entirely on black queer work, but Modern and Tofa really stayed within that terrain over the, the period. So hopefully uh, through their work, we can um, think about the ways in which um, Afri-queer both connects to the past and to the present, but also the way in which that work evolves in order to um, take in shifting landscapes. So very, very pleased to have you both here this morning. 
uh, welcome. And if I could just ask Maj, you first, just to introduce yourself and say a little bit about your, yeah, yourself and your work that you've done. Yeah, thank you, Lenny, Professor Lenny. Um, just want to say that. Um, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, for, for, for inviting us here and to all the organisers and um, um, the fact that Tofa's here is, and Zetu later is just totally making my day. Um, just people I respect enormously and work I follow. So it's a real privilege and pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, um, I think you know quite a bit about me already, most of you, but, uh, you know, I'm a performer, playwright, um, uh, I teach as well within academia, research, um, facilitate workshops as well. In terms of my background, I suppose it's good to know sometimes where people are coming from um, and where they come from, but more importantly, where they're coming from. Um, so um, as an artist, my work is um, very much um, informed by a very early training I did back in the 90s. Um, in an area of work called theatre of the oppressed, also known as kind of theatre for social change, very influenced um, by um, Brazilian theatre makers, in particular Augusto Boal and Barbara Santos. Um, so, so that kind of desire to um, is there a weird lighting thing happening. Sorry, Let's shift that. Um, uh, that desire to um, make theatre and performance work um, that engages people very directly, um, not only in debate, but coming up with uh, solutions to particular social problems and political problems is, is kind of very much informed who I, who I am as an artist and a person. Um, and also training back in the day with a theatre company that um, Lenny and I both have a connection with, and maybe Tofa too, I don't know, i find out maybe, um, Black Mime Theatre, um, which was a really important theatre company um, during the um, late 80s and 90s, um, which was the first black physical theatre company in um, Europe and was um, brutally cut um, by the Arts Council. And I think they rue the day they did that um, because it, that company was really ahead of its time. And one of the amazing things that that company did, Black Mind Theatre, um, through the leadership of Denise Wong, was to um, offer training in physical theatre to performers who hadn't, hadn't had that, those kinds of trainings before. Um, so so I, I also like to say that I trained with Black Mind Theatre. Um, and those are two very formative kind of parts of my identity as an artist and also very much a social change company, but really I'm um, starting working, working from the body. Um, uh, so my, my work has combined um, working in so-called community settings. I don't like the div division between community and professional, so-called applied and professional. I don't believe in it. I don't agree with it as a concept, um, but that's the kind of framework that we're in in Western academia. Um, but it's, yeah, so a lot of my work is involved kind of working with um, companies like Cardboard Citizens and Clean Break and all kinds of different companies working with people who are at the edge, pushed to the edge of society. Um, and also making over the last 15 years or so um, making my own work in collaboration with other artists very much across across artistic disciplines um, and foregrounding as Lenny said um, black life black experience at the intersection of queerness and at the intersection of disability as well um, so yeah I think that's probably enough and you'll hear about me as the day goes on great thank you much um Tofa um, can you would you like to say a few words about yourself and your your background and where you're oh, wow. coming from. Yeah, what a, what, a, what a proposition. So firstly, saying thank you to everybody, and especially to yourself, Lynette, for inviting me to this event. And um, it's great to always share a platform with Roger Solar and also to learn about new artists in the mix. Um, I'm just going to change my view. So I'm not looking at myself. Um, so yeah, I think it's um, interesting. There are different different, I think there are different kinds of stories we tell about ourselves and narratives that we tell about ourselves and our space in the world, depending on who we're speaking to. I guess the first thing I would say is that I'm a storyteller, first and foremost, in any medium that I can scavenge myself uh, resources to do in. So that includes moving image, um, uh, includes uh, moving image from in terms of essay film, it includes moving image in terms of 
standard drama making making stuff for television. It includes um, the the three dimensional space I call it, which is the space of performance and theatre as a director mainly. Um, and yeah, so I kind of had a bit of a you kind know, of a mainstream beginning at training with the regional theatre young directors training scheme. I never really trained as an actor or a performer, but that became something that. Uh, the performative space is something that I inhabit <laughs> constantly, I think. Um, and I'm very, very aware as a queer person of colour, um, queer black man, to, to, to very aware and very alive to what that means as a consequence to the way that I move through space and time. And that's kind of influenced everything I've done, all the films I've done, and even the mainstream work I've done. And, and, and also, I'm of the generation which in the 90s was coming into maturity, um, black and queer in the UK, who was seeing uh, an overwhelming uh, hostile environment from many different spaces. And I wanted to bear witness to the reality, the lived reality of my experience and those of my peers at the time, which wasn't necessarily one of victimhood, but one of celebration and joy. So myself and a fellow artist, Ajamo X, we, we created a project called the Ruckus Ruckus Federation, which was not necessarily an archive project at first, it was just a playful space for black queer reality to have an expression. And that was founded in 2000 and what came out of that was uh, Europe's largest um, and, and uh, archive of black queer life, which is hosted at the London Metropolitan Archives, which you can have access to if you, if you ever want to go there. Um, and shout out to the 30 artists, volunteers from around the world um, Afro-queer volunteers around the world who, who catalogued that for three years. Um, so my interests really are, uh, I, I run a couple of companies, I run, run a company called The Red Room, we built a, uh, a recycled theatre which won lots of awards and caused a lot of conversations around activism and climate change. Um, and so those that's part of my interest as well. Um, and naturally I'm more interested in much form as I'm function. I know that Lynette has sort of, you know, um, positioned this in a very sociological space, but I'm interested in, in how we do work, you know, the, the aesthetics, the, the mechanics, the, po the poetics of what we do. So, you know, the what, is it, what, what is film and the nature of film and how does film convey image and message, and memory and emotion, um, just as much as I am in terms of what might inspire me in terms of my lived experience from a sociological and political point of view. So yeah, I'm kind of on a little bit of a journey really, you know, still learning, still growing, um, still kind of eager to be whatever translator of the kinds of experiences and realities that I see out there for those who wish to listen and participate. So yeah, that's, that's me. Thanks, Tofa, and, th and thanks actually for that, that reminder of form, because form is also something that I think about in my work, especially in terms of the politics of the work. So for me, it's the combination of form and content that, that's been central to what, what I've explored. Maybe that takes us quite nicely into this, talking a little bit more, teasing out a little bit more what we think of as Afri queer theatre. Um, so Marge, in your work, you talk about Afri queer theatre, spelt Q-U-I-A, and Topher, when in your uh, bio, you talk about yourself as an Afro-queer artist. So just want to invite you both to say a little bit more about this idea of <clears throat> Afro-queer, um, maybe how you arrived at that term, because I know that when I was writing about Black, British, lesbian, playwrights. I called them Black, British, lesbian playwrights. Um, so that was in the late 1990s and into the 2000s. And I've been interested then in this, this term Afro-queer or Afri-queer, both terms, um, and thinking about the work that's done by using those terms compared to maybe um, Black British, <laughs> Black British theatre, which is what I always emphasise. So just want to invite you to say a little bit more about, about those terminologies that you use and, and what they do in terms of um, politics of thinking about Afro-queer work or Afro and Afro-queer work. Um, I don't know who wants to kick us off on that one. Topher smiling harder than I am, so I, I'm... I'm the, Go on, Topher. My mind is buzzing. Let's hear, yeah. let's hear no, I, mean, I just think it's an interesting, I like the way you said, how did we come about it? Because I think 
it's very it's only within the last year or two i've actually started using that phrase because part of it is you know look the, the space in which we inhabit as, as artists as people is not neutral we're not in a neutral space <laughs> you know we're in a space which has been constructed we ourselves programmed in certain kinds of ways about the way that we think about our identities um, and our sexualities and our genders and you know how do you unpro how do you deprogram and how do you work within frameworks which kind of speak to something of your histories which to me as a mystery on a personal level you know i am actually you know i was i was abandoned i was an abandoned child at one and a half I never got to know my mother and father. So I was, I'm very invested in the notion of where I come from. And a lot of where I came from was given to me. So you're a black man, you're, and when I was growing up, you were a gay or you were straight, you weren't bisexual, um, or you were funny or you were queer in a, in a derogatory way. And I think there's a very, it's just kind of, how do you kind of reconnect with, how do you find a language to describe the sorts of space that you inhabit you know, and that's kind of, I'm thinking about that a lot in terms of my travels, particularly in the global south, and thinking a lot about, you know, what my actual ancestry is, whether it be my, my actual technical DNA, but also my creative ancestry. What am I influenced by? What kind of, how, when I look at the ways in which West African physicality is within us right now in terms of our DNA, but partly because of the, uh, the, the, the enslaved era, and I look at the things that I personally have been interested in that have influenced my work, whether it be jazz of Dudi Bukwani, or whether it be the, the writing of, um, um, of you know, Kinsu or whether it be, you know, it, it, there, a lot of the people that I kind of engage in, the Brazilian um, black theater movement, with Abi Justo, Daciamente, the, there's, there's a lot of people I think I'm just gravitated towards, which are in the global south. So it just seems much more apt uh, and I grew up in and was programmed in the European traditions so when I was growing up in theatre a lot of people talked about Stanislavski and Grotowski and 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 and, and uh, you know the theatre of the absurd and you know there's a lot of stuff around that work which was dominant on this island and I just think that I wanted to release myself from that and I also wanted to signal to people who who were commissioning me who were working with me that I am a specialist. I have a specialist sort of, you know, perspective. I, have, I can bring a specialist uh, and, and thoroughly researched and thoroughly invested space. But they may see it as a minority space, but we know that it's part of the global majority. So it's, it's kind of, I, I sit within that confidence. And I'm excited by what it offers me as a way of entering into different understandings of different kinds of practices. So I'm trying to, I'm developing course for Central School of Speech and Drama called Theatre of Difference. And part of that is just about centering queerness and centering difference. And so it comes from my own identity as a different person, but it also comes from my curiosity as of, of almost like what I call the, 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 the blank spaces of history that I didn't know about until I got older and understood that actually there's a huge rich tradition of resistance, writing and aesthetics from the continent, from the diaspora, that will just keep me going forever. So that's my, that's where I, and of course being the queer thing is, the queer itself, again, a generational thing. When I was younger, queer was a derogatory name and now it's been reclaimed. But there's this, you know, queer is about resistance to the status quo. And queer comes from a very particular kind of energy that says, I will not sit still in any notion of understanding that you give me. I will discover my understanding and I will defiantly display it, enjoy it, celebrate it. I'm queer as fuck, <laughs> so you can all fuck off. Mm -hmm. And so there's a kind of a punk energy that I really love, which is kind of, in a sense, very European. But also if you look at Fela Kuti, and you look at the lyrics of Fela Kuti, or if you look at, um, excuse me, Bob Marley, you know, some of the, I choose two very kind of very easily recognizable names, but there are many others from the diaspora who, are, who have created, who've opened up the kind of a, the the, the, the the veneer of European sensibility and European civilization and cracked open that to say, look, mm. this isn't even the beginning or an end. We need to start somewhere else. Mm. And I think that's where I, I kind of, I find my queerness, my black queerness. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and also I was, I guess I was wondering, and maybe Maud, you can pick this up when, when you, in your response now, but I was also thinking about whether, and 
um, Topher's kind of just alluded to this, but thinking about whether Afri-queer is about the themes of the work, whether there has to be queer themes in a work for it to be Afri-queer, or whether actually it's about maybe the, the, the artist that's generating the work and no matter what the themes are. And also there in, in Topher kind of making links to uh, Fela Kuti and, and Bob Marley and kind of joining together people who we might not think of as queer and whether there's a way in which that black work is Afri-queer, no matter who's uh, producing it. I don't know what you think, um, Marge, about any of that. Yeah, I was just vibing with the with the energy, I suppose, that, that um, Tofa was talking about. And I think that um, speaks to your question, Lenny, about kind of who who is Afro queer and what what's Afro, Afro queer and who's in and who's out and all that kind of thing. I suppose um, how I kind of perceive it is is much more around um, a kind of playfulness and the resistance that Topher was talking about to labels and ideas of you know pre-prescribed programmed ideas of what of, of gender race sexuality um a kind of playfulness um a punkness uh um an out of the boxness and i suppose if if an artist describes their work in that term then if they wanted to self-describe their work as afro-queer or afro-queer i wouldn't question anybody who want to describe their work in that way. I'm not interested in who people go to bed with at night um, in order to describe their work. And I, I yeah, I mean, I think um, there's a, it's a, it's a, it's this, I suppose, obsession with classification is, is, a, is a Western obsession, is a Western academic obsession um, that still is so pervasive. Um, and what I'm, I suppose, what I'm, I'm not particularly interested in terms of calling myself or my work Afro queer is to kind of just continue a, uh, a series of, you know, continue another classification, but really to to have a new word to to express a feeling, an energy, a desire, um, style, and um, that people can use or not use or throw away. Um, but absolutely in resistance to to actually to the English language, to, to the way mm. in which the English language contains and controls and defines artwork and identity. Um, and, the, and English is a colonial language. There's no way around that. It's the language of, first and foremost, it's the language of colonialism. And so it's 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 riddled and rife um, with ways of colonizing the mind and so and so I, I I'm always trying to you know it's my if my first language it's the only language I'm completely fluent in in words um, but I'm fluent in many many other things and so I want to find different kinds of words to make up words play with words um, and I think that is very black and very queer in doing that as well just making it up ourselves in messy, playful, provocative ways. Um, I, th I think that is what blackness and queerness is about. Um, you know, uh, so um, there's, there's a, and, but, but maybe for those who like a little bit of theory, there's a really wonderful African, a scholar of African sexualities called Stella Nyanzi, and I'll write their name in the chat later, who's worked closely with Zetu Matabeni, who, who you'll, some of you, if you're staying for the day, you'll meet later. Who says how important it is um, to 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 queer Africa to to make up our own words to to reclaim our own words um, because there's this pervasive myth that um, queer sexualities homosexuality etc are not African uh, are not black mm. uh, and also that this other pervasive myth dominant myth that somehow homosexualities queernesses came from Europe. Um, and so, and so they're, they're big battles that we have is to try and just debunk those myths and, and get away from those myths. And one way of doing that is one, rec remembering the words we already had pre-colonialism, remembering the words that we created during colonialism to express our sexualities as black queer people, and also rec and making new words up. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm Afro-queer. Yeah. And we had this, didn't we? Because I was like, struggling with the pronunciation because I'm looking at it and going oh it's Afrikia what is it and you were like no it's just 
Africa, Africa, that's just what it is. It's just spelled in a different way. And you gave it a particular pronunciation. Can you give that for me or accent? Oh, well, I'll just throw a kind of West African queer spin on it, sure. Afriqueer, but I'm, I'm not the first to do this, you know, everybody's got their own thing and it, it's inspired by E. Patrick Johnson, who's mm. this extraordinary um, uh, scholar of, uh, of Black Queer Studies, and there's a, if people haven't seen it, this book, Black Queer, Black Queer Studies is just, yeah, it just blew my mind, it's, it's about 10 years old now, actually, I think, mm -hmm. um, and in that book, there's an article about a um, uh, about that, about language and about queer and, and using using the phrase queer in the kind of mm. queer and a kind of deep south kind of way or you can even hear a little Caribbean twin, tinge in there of queer um, even Irish queer um, rather than thinking of queer I don't know mm -hmm. I just find those two e's remind me of the queen <laughs> <laughs> and it's just a bit nasal a little bit European, a little bit mm, queer, and it just doesn't do anything for my groin. Yeah. I need an A to open me up. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned the queen because well, before you said that, I was actually thinking about how I wonder how it would sound in Barbadian. My parents were Barbados. So I was thinking, I wonder how the Barbadian accent was, would, would say that. And of course, Barbados have just separated from the queen. So uh, it might be it might be right about Afrikia, Afrikia, Afrikia. I think they probably might say in Barbados. So um, and related to your own your own histories and, and uh, identities. Um, so I'm just going to move on a little bit. I'll, I'll just remind people that as, as we're talking, if you've got any questions, um, please put them into the the, the the chat, and we'll come to questions from the chat in maybe in about ten or fifteen minutes for the last section of this um, of this session. Um, but I wanted to go back to clubbing. Uh, it's long days past for me. Um, I've already indicated that many of us were on the, the same kind of clubbing scene. Um, and earlier on this year, when we met, uh, me, your, your, uh, Marge, Topher, uh, Ricky Beadle Blair, um, Tundurai, Valerie Mason John, and uh, Travis Alabanza, we met for a round table um, to, to get some material for the book that Modge and I are working on. And we ended up talking about, about clubbing and some of the places we used to go. I used to go to the Black Women Only Space, Shugs in Brixton. There was a mixed Black Gay Club in Brixton as well, just underneath the arches. I can't remember the name of it. Um, there was a Monday night, I think, at the Astoria as well that, that some of us used to, to go to. And in this round table, we were also... Um, we also sort of noted that clubbing appears in so many black plays. So Ricky Beadle Bear's Bashment, uh, Travis Alabanza talks about uh, their work as uh, being inspired as being a club performer, but also Overflow is set in a, a club toilet. Uh, Stars, of course, has a live. DJ, uh, Valerie Mason, John Sindykes, we were talking about going into that performance and being frisked um, before we could get into the, the Oval House to, to watch the show. Um, Temi, Wickles, Temi Wilkie, oh, that was the other person, sorry, I missed off, who's the high table has a moment where we do the electric slide, characters do the electric slide and the audience get up and do the electric slide with them um, at the end of the show. So we were kind of talking about clubbing and I, I wanted to come to you maybe Topher to maybe talk us through a little bit the ways in which clubbing or clubs or queer black queer club spaces have informed um, anything in, in your in your work um, oh hugely so I mean, you can tell us a little bit about yeah that. I mean it's difficult to say to pinpoint one thing I mean the first thing is that you grow up, you know I grew up in the clubs I was a club kid so um internationally I mean you know uh, there was this thing in Virgin Atlantic used to have 99 pound return to New York, which they had like a flash sale. And then you, 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 you kind of, uh, it was late nineties, but so there wasn't so much of an internet thing. I think it was just like advertised on TV or something. You saw it on the magazines or TV. I think they even advertised it like gay papers or whatever. And so it was 99 pounds and it was a flash sale. It was like several, and you, you bought that ticket for Thursday and you returned on Monday. And they were my <laughs> clubbing, clubbing pilgrimages to places like, um, the Paradise Factory, Escalitos, um, 
um, lost in lost in lost in 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 the night really. Um, but I think what I will say is it's the transgression that's allowed in club spaces, and that transgression has always been a space which has been. I mean, traditionally, black black clubs have been in the Western world have been the transgressive spaces. Black queers clubs have also been the transgressive spaces, spaces where. Uh, as you probably know, we call church or the church. There are spaces of release, liberation, freedom, community, sex, obviously, um, and, and sort of discovering identity. So they're essential, really, to the idea of black queerness, I think, in, and, 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 and also in very much operating in antithesis to the daytime. <laughs> You know, you have darkness. You have your undercover of darkness. So you can walk from this this very kind of you know ordinary street. You probably need to get there if at first, but that's always an interesting journey. You know what you might be wearing, where you not be, where you might not be wearing. But then you go from this place into this black box, which is, becomes a space of magic, and you completely become somebody different. You, you're performative. You perform you peacock, you do all sorts of things. But also we have the space actually where actual community takes place. You know, people are mentored, people, new, new relationships and organizations and art pieces and, you know, careers, everything happens in that space. And of course we have the Vogue tradition from North America, which sounds so kind of like the Vogue tradition. I mean, we have fucking Vogue, you know what I mean? We kind of like, and the Vogue replicating the whole notion of the hierarchy of capitalism in terms of, you know, the kinds of performative ways in which whiteness kind of doesn't think of itself as performative. We then perform these roles, you know, real butch realness and passing and, you know, all these other kinds of spaces. So the creativity and the energy, but it also when you go back, you look at the way our bodies move and the way that our bodies move in those spaces and how we allow ourselves to kind of interact physically, how the language is, well, isn't English. <laughs> it's another language, languages we both invent, or both we inhabit, and ones in which we kind of really kind of become sacred, really. So clubbing is really essential to us as black queer people. Um, because they're also, I don't, I, I don't like this word safe spaces because it, it kind of creates a whole kind of hierarchy of um, inside and outside, but there are spaces of safety <laughs> because once you leave that space, then you are involved in a whole a huge negotiation with your, um, your, the, the ways in which you can move through the world in, in, in the rest of the world. And, and I think that stress, that, that kind of negotiation is that kind of preparing to meet the faces that we meet out there is it becomes a real counterpoint in which we judge ourselves. Um, and everybody I know, um, younger, younger friends as well, because clubbing still carries on, have their stories of, yeah, when I was doing the clubs, how I grew up in the clubs. And I think that's really, really important. So even, so the work, the only, the, I mean, I'm not necessarily, the clarity I created in Fetish, some of that comes through in that space, the release as well. So I'm really excited. I'm totally excited about coming. I mean, for the first, I don't know, 25 years of my life, I think, I mean, like adult life, up until like, you know, within the last five years, I've been clubbing. I still do club internationally more. And I think it's one of the most exciting, progressive, creative, political, transgressive spaces that we have ever inhabited in the modern era. So, yeah. Yeah, and plus what a reminder. I, I mean, I never went to New York. Never, I never got on a plane to go to a club, but maybe Amsterdam once <laughs> or twice. Yeah. But, uh, no, I'm. I, I and going to out. New York, that's that's taking it. So I'm just talking about Brixton. <laughs> in it, in it. I'm talking yeah. about a tube journey. You're talking about butterfly. Well done, well done. Sorry, Moj, I cut you there. You yeah, no, not at all. I was just, I was, think, I was thinking about fetish actually, and as as Sophie was speaking, and about the. I, I didn't think about it this in this way when I was watching it, and um, but the 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 energy of the club on the street somehow, and. Um, uh, the performance, the ecstasy, the um, the the the, 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 the not the breaking of rules, the, the the kind of 
yeah, the changing of rules, the kind of, you know, the, yeah, just the boundaries that are completely different in, in the club. What you see, do, experience in the club. Um, uh, if you were to put that on the street, you might get yourself arrested or you might be fetish, you know, you, you kind of, um, so I, I think it's kind of, that's really interesting. I was just really, sorry, riffing off that idea of, 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 of fetish, not, 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 I'm not, not, not trying to just define it, but as you were speaking, I was thinking, oh, wow, yeah, you could think of that whole film as, as the club kind of inside out mm, um, and, and the, ex the ecstasy of that and the danger sometimes of it and, mm. and, the, and the music, wow. Yeah, the music was just awesome. And it was also just riffing off what you're saying, thinking about um, that whiteness, um, whiteness as experienced has never had to and, and doesn't demand performance. Blackness demands performance. And queerness. And queerness demands performance, absolutely. That there's no, there isn't an experience of blackness and queerness outside of, outside of performance. That's, you know, you know, because as soon as um, as soon as our bodies arrived on the shores of the Caribbean and Latin America and America, etc., um, we had to, and probably before that, perform in certain ways and were, you know, uh, you know, um, oppressed into perform and persecuted into performing in certain ways, and the construct of heter heteronormativity insists when heteronormativity becomes dominant and classified and Christianized, um, that we have to perform in certain ways. And I'm not just talking about victim here, no. but, um, you know, we're more than that. Um, but there, but we were, we were black, blackness as a, as a thing begins, begins in that oppression, you know, before that we were Yorubas and Ashantis and everybody yeah. else, Zulus and whoever. So, uh, uh, but to celebrate that, that we, that, that's why we're so fucking good at it as well. You know, we're, we, we define, define what performance is from the Definitely. Night, it's, but, you know, but, so, but dancing, yeah. dancing is liberation. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, the consciousness of that has come to the fore with more my millennial friends talk a bit about that more consciously. When I was younger, I wasn't thinking about it so much in that way, but as queer people, dancing is liberation. It's just so important. You know, liberation, not just like, um, I mean, like proper liberation, as in like, stop making me move in this way. <laughs> mm. White, whiteness, capitalism, the Western world, or even just colonialism. Stop making me move this way. I want to move in a different way. And I discover this movement in myself. And that's where my blackness and my queerness emerges from. And that's where Evoke comes from. I mean, it, it comes from a different, it comes from saying, I will move in a different kind of way. And so I love that about the liberation of dance. When I hear dance liberation in, 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 in the past, I've always equated it to sort of, you know, people have equated to, no offense to the fans of Pina Bausch or, you know, but I mean, people have equated it to different kinds of ways in which people think about um, the body in a space, which has kind of got codified kind of, you know, parameters. You know. But I think for us, I think it's just a very different thing. And, you know, it's a very, it's a cliche, but we used to get arrested on the street for waving our arms around, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> for being expressive, <laughs> you know, you're, you're being angry, you're being over emotional. Our expressiveness gets curtailed. So we have to be, we have to find a space of liberation. I think the work that you do, Modi, sort of does that as well in terms of, you know, the, the, the use of the boxer. Uh, <laughs> I think with Muhammad Ali and me, I always saw that as, as a way of, of a, da a dance of liberation. It wasn't, you know, obviously, the, but because he himself did that when he was working through, look at me, look at me move, look at how I move, look at how I cut through all your bullshit with my moves, look at my prettiness, look at my legs. He danced, and I think you did that, you brought that into that space with um, Muhammad Ali and me, and I think that's what I love about that. Or even the collaboration with, um, you know, even with, you know, the work you do with South Africa at work, the, you know, the, I think the, the way that, yeah, the performer entered the bin and left the bin, you know, there's just there's so much in the way that we think we find. And I've not seen, 
anything more crazy, more creative in the black and black performance, you know, spaces or that I've seen in clubs. Nothing. I've everything. I've seen both. I've seen gymnastics. I've seen people wearing stuff. I've seen people wearing nothing. I've seen people creating different kinds of moves. I've seen people coming out of different kinds of places um, or moving their bodies and so on. I think that's that's just so. I find interesting doing a piece that had a character on a street to breaking down that breaking down that um, notion of you know there you have to be formalized in the space to to call something performance mm. and, and 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 then you need to then put walls around it to tell you what kind of performance it is and where it comes from mm. and i think that's what we do as africa people <laughs> <laughs> kind of, we, we, we resist we, we resist that maybe I don't mm. know. I was also thinking about um, as you've both been talking there, and and it's in my notes actually as well about the vulnerability again, something that we talked about um, earlier on in in the year. So um, thinking about, I'm thinking about interrogation of Sandra Bland. I'm thinking about some of the themes in your work. Thinking about um, you, you Topher also in in a fetish, and I'm just I'm wondering whether. There's something in this work that kind of both taps into making yourselves vulnerable, quote unquote, as performers, but also taps into the vulnerability of black bodies on the streets. I was really struck, um, Tofa, because I I'd never seen fetish before preparing for today, and I was really struck at the way that it kind of interweaves blackness with queerness. I'm going back to themes. Sorry, but with the kind of Black Lives Matter and what you've just said there, and you know, in the club. We were safe, it was a safe space, we could explore, we could express, uh, we could be free. But then when we come back out on the streets, well, how safe are we? And I was really struck by the way in which um, that um, film kind of made me think about the, and the writing around it made me think about kind of the safety of uh, black bodies in terms of like how we express ourselves on the street. And that maybe ties in with the work that you did more, John, the interrogation of Sandra Bland. So the idea that you're going about your daily life, right? You're driving your car, you're whatever, and then you become um, you're reminded of your, your vulnerability. So I don't know whether either of you wants to say something about vulnerability in the work. And then after that, I will move on to questions on the floor. There's a few comments in the chat already that I will um, speak and also remind people to put uh, direct questions up if you if you want to ask them but yeah vulnerability I wonder if there's anything to say there in terms of Afri-queer Afri-queer Afri -queer work yeah Arch. thinking about it and thinking about um Maybe it's easier to talk through some of the work that you've mentioned. So with the interrogation of Sandra Bland, um, which in brief was uh, a response to a request from Samelia Hodge Dalloway and um, Reggie Edmund, who had formed an organization called Black Lives, Black Words, and still have, um, which is kind of based in America and Canada and Britain and wherever else and people want to get involved in it's kind of the I suppose in short, the black lives, um, black sort of it's the theatre kind of expression of black, uh, of black lives matter, um, or one of them. Um, and there's a book called Black Lives, Black Words, published by Oberon. If people want to see some of the plays that have been written, and and they, and, and they invited Reggie and Samilia invited people to write short plays in response to um, to questions around Black Lives Matter. And I was in one of those one of those iterations at the Bush Theatre, and I didn't know what to write. I was just totally stumped and um, to write a 15 minute play on do Black Lives Matter today, you know, it's kind of like, yes, no, I don't know how to write from this. And then I, like loads of people did, and maybe some people here have done, uh, I was just looking online a few years ago and I saw the arrest of um, Sandra Bland, um, which was recorded on the dash cam of, of the police, uh, arresting police officer in senior. Um, and it lasts almost 15 minutes. And I thought, well, you could not write this 
you could not write it. Um, how it es escalates from one person being pulled over by a police car for not signalling a lane change, something as simple as that, um, to being um, found dead in her in, in a police cell two days later. Um, and anyway, people can look into that, um, the life of Sergeant Bland, if you, if you want to. Um, so I just transcribed what happened there and, um, and broke it up into lots and lots of different voices. And my vision was to have 100 black women um, speak the words of Sandra Bland all together and one white man to, to, to speak in that, to, to play the role of Insignia. And it's had various different um, iterations, but it's very impromptu, by the way, if you're academics and you ever wanna just do this pop-up performance in your classrooms, in your conferences, um, it doesn't need rehearsal. You can just, just do it by projecting the text up or it can be a very rehearsed thing. It was at the Goodman Theatre in Chicago, it was at the Bush Theatre in London, all that kind of thing. Not to boast about it, but I'm just saying it can have many different kinds of life as a piece of work. And it's, um, and it, it's not about the plays and theatre. It's, it's, um, it's just Black Lives Matter activism through performance. Um, but in terms of vulnerability, obviously Sandra Bland, knew that experience that Topher knows that I know that Lenny knows that we all know as black people how um in a in a moment you could go from just just being yourself and just doing your thing and just living your life um to being on the to be on the to being on the edge of arrest or death or um danger um, and this isn't to sort of be melodramatic, it's just a fact. It's just kind of like driving in your car and it's like, oh, okay, now it's that moment. In Britain as well, often, often these things, you know, become about America and they're not, it's not about America. It's about whiteness and white supremacy. And um, so for me, um, so there was something about just making the decision to say we're not going to be alone on that stage that Sandra Bland was alone in that car and she was alone in that police station she was alone in that cell or was she who was with her who did what they did how did she die but she certainly didn't have any of us around her so the desire to have a hundred black women I would have a thousand and also men have played Sandra Bland now we've done we've had those iterations as well um, that we won't um, that yes, we know we can be extremely vulnerable, but we'll be together in, in that and that we have a, an enormous power together, even if we're not physically together, knowing that we are out here, you know, um, out here in the world um, is for me incredibly um, strengthening. And I think that's going back to the club. I think that's something something for me that the club can do as well, that you go into the club and that space of being surrounded by hundreds or tens of other queer people black people with you and then you then you're sitting on the back of the bus on the night bus on your way home but you take that feeling of having been together with others into your body and you carry it and you have to keep going back like church that's why we talk about it like church because you go back every sunday and you get that feeling again so that you can walk out in the street and do your and live your life and um so yeah there's something about making the interrogation of sandra bland and, and and um, taking the most vulnerable moment you could possibly be in as a black woman. Um, you know, she's, she's searched at one point um, and the police officer in senior says to her, do you have anything on your person that could be illegal? And she says, I'm wearing a maxi dress. And those of those their dresses, it's just a one piece dress with nothing else but your underwear underneath maybe. I'm wearing a maxi dress, you know, do, do, does it look like I have anything on me? So she's, she, summertime, you know, just a one slip dress, the, you know, she's also epileptic and she's slammed on the ground and, it, and, 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 and told it doesn't matter, you know, it, that, that he doesn't care that she, that she has epilepsy. So she's incredibly vulnerable, black, woman with a disability, an invisible disability. Um, but, and, and I'm sorry, maybe we should have, you know, maybe we should have done a, a, a content warning before we even begin. And maybe we do that now, that, that, that we're gonna talk about really painful things today. Um, and, but we deal with it all the time. I don't even think about giving a content warning because how can you give a content warning your whole life? So here it is. But anyway, but that moment of vulnerability that she was in 
it's a way, I suppose, as performers, as artists say, we'll never, act, we'll not have that vulnerability again. We will not be that vulnerable again. We will stand with her and, and all of us, not, not just Sandra Brand, of course, many, many, many other people. So that was just kind of one way of trying to mm. um, be vulnerable and also be powerful. Thanks, Marge. Thanks so much. Um... Um, I think we'll get to some of the some of the comments actually sure. there in the chat while we while we just process that and maybe Taylor will come back in again afterwards. Let me just find my way through it. Um, so the first one is from Irene. I'll read these out just to may, mainly in the interest of time actually. So um, so Irene says, uh, reading Roger's fantastic article, I understand that black performance desires to bring something into being through ritual, activism, social change. Afri queer embodies that desire and not only speaks across identities, but articulates identities. So distinction there from E. Patrick Johnson. Um, as identity is on the move, I wonder how Afri queer also remains unfixed, unboxed, ever changing and messy. Um, that's uh, one comment. I'll just see if there's a couple more. Um, I think that might be it. And then the then Lorenzo as well. How important was feeling to be part of a community in the clubs you were talking about to freely de develop blackness and queerness as part of your identity as a young person? So inviting us there to kind of uh, reflect reflect back. So I don't know, Tofa. I've, I've got gallery view on, so I can't see where you are. I'm still there. here. Hello. Yes, you're there. Yeah. You're, you're moving, moving around. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know whether you want to respond to either of those. Um, not, not really, comments. to be honest. No? no, because I think part of it, I think, I think people have got to understand that this isn't just an academic exercise. <laughs> yeah, sure. I don't really want to talk about that's some important. of those those times, and I can't really succinctly say. And it's yeah. it's a little, and I, I kind of resist this idea of going. Of, of I, I resist a, a, a picture that's tidy, you know. Um, people went to clubs to survive. <laughs> yeah. You know, they were going to get beaten up, ostracized, fucked up. Something happens going to happen to them. Sometimes people went to clubs because there was nowhere else to go. So I think yes, there's a celebration. Yes, there's all sorts of other things happening. Um, and some people didn't find community because there are, mm. there's also layers of difference within queerness that people mm. aren't accepted. You know. And I think so. I find I find that way of framing a conversation mm. problematic because mm. I, I resist the neatness of it. Um, mm. uh, and the the you know the I, Lenny myself Mod, Mod, uh, now we're we're of a certain age, um, but we have you know. But like when we were younger, there was a you know a, a huge. What I loved about being in the diasporic experience, which means going to North America going to the Caribbean, going to South America, particularly, and even in parts of cities in Europe, you know, going to parts of Paris or, or, or Berlin um, and discovering the communities that are there and, the, and, and having this constant mainstream reductive conversation about black people and gay people. <laughs> And just seeing this kind of huge, kind of unexpected, bewildering, surprising multitude of difference in the blackness and queerness. So I kind of resist the starting point of that question. But in terms of the vulnerability issue, I think, or conversation, mm -hmm. I mean, the aesthetics of, just let me just say this, the aesthetics of fetish, and that is a character, is similar to what, uh, you know, what, what, what Mojisola was saying in terms of the way that she may or may not be inspired by the, the, the footage when we when those that plethora of for say from sort of 14 15 16 17 those plethora of camera phone cell phone captured images of people living their lives doing their things some of which were then lost their lives some of which were then either really brutally injured or were in somehow other kind of injustice of an arrest even if it was just racially profiled by an airbnb you know a neighbor um the, the, the film opens with seven cameras, you know, and there's there's seven cameras of, of which five are cell phones, five are iPhones or or um, or Android phones, and it opens long shots. You don't know where this person's coming from. You you're disorientated by what you see, and it's exactly the emotional impact of when you watch one of those what I call snuff movies. Um, you are disorientated. 
you're bewildered, you don't quite know what's happening, you can't, you're fascinated, you're repelled. And, you know, so that's the beginning. And that's the beginning. And, and so, yes, there's all the things I agree with Montessori about the vulnerability of, and I'm, uh, of, of what it feels to be a, in a space where anything can happen at any time. But there's a, my other film, Invisible, deals with, this, deals with a similar themes. You can check it out it's online, it's called Invisible, um, which positions questions of, of um, has conversations around um, mental health um, um, and masculinity um, and othering and visibility. Um, and also kind of has a kind of conversation between inside and outside the, 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 the so-called public space and private space. And I think what I was trying to do with Fetish as a beginning, it's not where we end, it's not where we get to, was to sort of open up that conversation about what are you really seeing? And why are you seeing this? And what is your investment in this? And I think those sort of questions aren't answerable, really. And, um, and I want you to find a way of disturbing the peace about, uh, so, so the whole kind of way in which um, the conversation, as I said earlier, <laughs> Lenny, has been very anthropological around, and quite rightly, and sociological about us. But I wanted to bring the huge sense of feeling and humanity. I wanted people to say, and that's kind of why sometimes, I mean, I'm not being precious, that's why showing it on a big screen as opposed to a small screen, you know, I have lots of conversations about that. It needs to be seen communally in a much bigger screen. Because it, it create it's 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 full of very um, um, cinematic, very very kind of you know verbose cinematic language. It's a small screen; you kind of miss some of that. But um, so the, the question of first saying, you know, yes, this space is one where 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 there is a, a real a real vulnerability. But by the end of the film, you're you're in a different kind of hopefully in a different kind of space, and you're emotionally connected to a, a humanity which you can't necessarily define i'm hoping mm. that's what we do with fetish i don't know yeah great thank you thank you and yeah just to remind to people that lenny you mm. muted yourself uh, just a thank you tova thank you um uh, yeah, just a reminder that the film will be available to watch till the end of the day and watch it on as large a screen as, as possible. So try not to watch it on handheld phones or because as Tofa saying, you can get the best effect if it's on a on a larger screen. I'm um, aware of time and of keeping to time. And I guess maybe just to kind of close uh, this discussion, there's lots of comments in the, the chat. Please do revisit that. But maybe just to close this, this discussion off and Quick answers, short answers, just to invite Moj. And Tofa gave a nice, nice ending there, actually. But Moj, to kind of, what do you hope for for the future of uh, Afri queer theatre? Where do you, where do you think it might go go next? How do you think it might might develop? Um, just for a closing word. I know we talked about the intergenerational in our in our book. Uh, that we're working on and I didn't quite get there in the questions uh, this morning and our time is against us but I just wonder whether you know seeing the new generation coming through Travis, Temi and so on picking up on some of the work that was done before whether that is the kind of future um, particularly Travis's work bringing in kind of trans gender non-conforming identities into the, that, that discussion as well don't know. Do you have any final thoughts there, Mosh? Yeah, I think perhaps Africa theatre and performance, and you know, what I would like to see is is a is a reaching further and further to to what is considered the edge, and in in um, agricultural permacultural terms, as in not monoculture, but but growing organically and sustainably. Um, um, there's this phrase, phrase of the edges where it's at, that the, 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 edge is, the edge is always the most fertile ground in a garden, in a, in a field, um, the edge of the riverbank, the edge of the lake, the edge of the mountain. Um, so, and I think there are many, many voices, experiences, um, lives, identities right on the edge. Um, and 
particularly I'm thinking about people with disabilities, particularly deaf people, particularly people with visual impairment, particularly people with invisible disabilities, particularly people with mental health issues, particularly intersex lives, trans lives, um, and also the, just the global South generally, you know, African experience, um, indigenous experience. Um, so who's, you know, what I always feel uncomfortable about is suddenly becoming the mainstream. I feel yeah. like I'm mainstream black queer now because I know because of how many times I get invited to do a talk like this. <laughs> so that worries me. And I think who else, who, who else should be here now? Who's there? Who, who's, yeah. who's, who's chair am I in now? Where's, you know, who's not here? Um, so that's my desire is to reach constantly be reaching towards the edge. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Modge and Topher. Um, people, you can unmute and uh, applaud. Um, thank you very much. Ooh, for you've this. been told. Woo! Yeah, you've been told. You're going to be yeah, told yeah, where you can to say if you applaud. Yeah. <laughs> At least we're told. No, what it is, is that sometimes it's like you people are applauding and it's <laughs> muted. It's like, yeah, applaud, do this, or make, make the sound if you can. That's, that's why I'm saying unmute. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, uh, for this morning. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tofa, for joining us. And uh, we're going to take a break now. Um, I'm two minutes out, so we're going to take 10 minutes anyway. We'll rejoin at 22 minutes. Past